Good morning, everybody. How is everybody this morning? Good, good to see you. If you would and are able, please stand and I will lead us in prayer first thing this morning. So if you would, please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for another day that we can come here and worship you, Lord. And just please be with us today as we worship you and, and sing to you, Lord, and, and play this music and just watch over us today. Please watch over all those that couldn't be here today for whatever reason, Lord, and, and please be with Brother Rick as he brings a message. All these things, we ask your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. Our first song today, we're going to do This is Amazing Grace. We're just going to do two today, so it'll be pretty cool. All right. This is Amazing Grace. Sing with us, guys.
I gotta say this real quick. As we were playing, I could see your shirt and there's like your sparkles on your shirt. It looked like you were taking pictures, and I was like, "Why is she over there taking pictures?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I was just like, I "Wonder why she's taking pictures for?" <laughs> oh, I know. Hopefully, that's a good thing. No. <laughs> Our uh, last song today we're gonna do is "Good Good Father." And if you guys would do me a favor, if if Olivia and Tristan then come in on this song, I want you guys. Turn and just stare them down when they come along with you. <laughs> just kidding, don't do that. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> All right, good, good father. <clears throat> again for coming. It's good to see you guys.
There we go. We'll see how that does. <laughs> Matthew, if you'll put up the statement of Christology for us, please. And we're going to read this together. Because we're not able to keep the, the, our, our, ourselves from sin entirely doesn't mean we ought, to, we ought not seek to keep it entirely. Well, let's read this statement of Christology together. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh. Rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again. Glory and judgment. For us he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Now, if you would, turn your Bibles. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 20, and we're going to finish up Matthew 20 today. And you should not see these as disconnected sermons. They aren't. They're connected by the, the, uh, the text as we've been moving through. Uh, our, my habit, your habit, is to go through one, one verse at a time, moving through the entirety of God's Word. We're moving through Matthew. I'm not even sure how long we've been in Matthew, but we've been in it for 20 chapters. I can tell you that much. We're getting ready to close that out today. And I, and I think it's very important. The reason I, I, I teach and preach in an expositional way is not because it's the longest and most drawn out. It may, in fact, be that. It's the most thorough. And I find that the best saints are those that are thoroughly trained in God's Word. And instead, there are many who hop about the text of Scripture depending upon what they had for lunch on Saturday. Um, I think that's ill-fated. That's poorly thought out. But instead, we move methodically, purposefully, through all of God's Word. So we're moving through, and we've gotten to this place, and, and we're going to find that this talks about some blind men that are calling out to David, calling out to the son of David. It's a messianic title. Let me give you that at the first. It's a messianic title, and this is not the first time blind men have cried out. We see it in Luke, we see it in Mark, we see it in other places in Matthew. People that know they have a need cry out for Christ. One of the great difficulties in the, in the Christian world is there are people that have a need that don't, in fact, know they need it. There are people that, that, that the greatest difficulty is to convince them that they are, in, fra in fact, a sinner. I was talking about that just a moment ago. And the idea of being a sinner is that you've, in any way, transgressed the perfect law of God. You've not done it perfectly. You know, I know there are people out there that say that they've not transgressed it, but I have yet to run into them, thank God, because I, I just couldn't believe that there would be somebody so narcissistic and so, so ill-sighted that they believe that they, in fact, had never sinned. Most people at least admit in some way they sin. Now, they, they of course, let the... The condition of most humanity is that I see your sin more plainly than I see my own. I, I, see, I see when you transgress, but I, I think I've probably only really rubbed up against it every now and then. Now, that's the, that's the condition that most of us hold. And it is, in fact, a rather universally held. Uh, people can see others' sin, but they can't see theirs. Or at least they don't see it as, as they ought to. In fact, uh, the natural man, and uh, a bit of the, what we're going to read later in 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man looks at himself and sees no reason for God to be upset with him. The natural man has no sense of the grasp of God's holiness. That's one of the things that's been lost in the current church. In, in today's church, we want to make God cuddly. We want to make God easy to approach. Isaiah 6 denies any such thing. Jesus Christ brings him close, and yet he is to be approached, you can approach him, he's approachable, but never do you approach him with what is rightly due to him. Jesus Christ alone is the Savior, 
He is the God-man. And, and there are many today in our churches that, that, that have reduced him to something more akin to an uncle or a cousin twice removed or some odd thing. Terrible idea. Really rather horrid. But these blind men, they see what so many can't today because we've been covered over with a, with a philosophy and a psychology that says we're all okay. Maybe we need Jesus in the, in the bad spots and he'll carry us through in those, sp- those spots. You know, you know the, uh, the footprints in the sand thing that so many people like? I have never liked it because I don't think it's, it's actually correct. Some people think it's actually a biblical understanding. Now, I, I think if it was a biblical understanding, you'd only ever seen one set of footprints because Christ is, in fact, carrying you every single step of the way. And those footprints would be recessed down in the sand because he's bearing you about constantly. Right? That, that's the biblical narrative. That's the way the Bible understands it. What the Bible also professes is that the natural man is incapable, is altogether without the ability to see God, to know God, or to make him known. That, that's John chapter 3, a very religious man. Nicodemus comes to see Jesus. And Jesus tells this teacher, this Pharisee, this, this man who was, had great knowledge, tells him, look, you can't even see the kingdom. You can't be in the kingdom unless you've been born from above. Now, that's a strange phrase there, born from above. But it is is actually set forth there in John 3. And and the the difficulty is is we've arrived at a place where we talk about being born again. You usually don't see me using that phrase, born again. Typically, I mean, I'll say born from above or regenerate. Uh, because that born again phrase has been taken and used. You, you'll have born again musicians, which has it has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with their commitment to Christ, with their ability to follow, or or even that they're a person of faith at all. What they mean is, look, he fell away for a while, and now he's back to playing the guitar or the piano or the drums or whatever it is he plays, and and he's doing it all again. He's born again. Well, that's a misuse of a of a term. Somebody has confiscated our words, if you will, and they have made them, rendered them useless. Because born again or born from above, they have great meaning. In fact, rolled up into the meaning of the born from above or born again is the idea of a supernatural act on God's end that makes you a child of God and apart from which you can never be a child of God. That, that, that's, that's what it means biblically. But let's read, the, let's read the text, and we're going to see what these blind men see, but yet people today with full-functioning eyes and ears can neither see nor hear because they don't want to. So Matthew 20, beginning at verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, by the way, this is not the original Jericho. This is another Jericho. A great, cloud, a great crowd followed him, and behold, there were two men two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes. And immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Please bow your head. Father, aid your servants this morning. Help us, Lord, as we endeavor to do the work of the gospel. Help us this morning as we we seek to worship rightly. Men are always worshiping. Most regularly, it's, it's done poorly. In fact, it increases their debt of sin to you because they choose to worship themselves or something they have formed rather than worshiping the one whose whose image they bear and has formed us. Aid us, Lord, this morning as we seek not only to worship you, but in our ascribing greatest worth to you, to know you as you are and to see you with eyes opened wide ears having been unstopped 
and a soul that is filled with the love for you that is not only supernatural, but carries us on into eternity. Pray God bless them now. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. These men were suffering from physical blindness. I'm going to tell you it's better to suffer physical blindness than it is spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is the condition in, in which you and I were all, in fact, born into the world. You, you can talk to people. When you, when, you, when you talk to people who are unbelieving today, understand what you're talking to is, is a person who has no eyes for Christ, no ears. Jesus often says, he who has eyes to see and ears to hear. From, from a biblical perspective, what we understand and know is that we have none of that naturally. That you, when you and I are born into this world, we are born religious, yet separated. Separated by the nature of our sin, separated by our inability and, and lack of desire for the things of God. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't be religious. They can be quite religious. In fact, one of the biggest problems in this world is that many religions are simply only good for the damnation of the soul of the practitioner. Being religious doesn't get you to God. Because your religion has to be that which is, in fact, of God, from God, to God, rather than just something that you've conjured up or you feel. That one of the biggest mistakes we make today is people feel it's like a cafeteria plan. You can go in, you want a little of this and a little of that, but you'll have none of this and none of that, as though you were the determiner of anything, which is really just a, a, a big dose of pride and a real lack of humility. Even today, some in, in the church, they, they want to dismiss certain things about God and take other things. Well, look, we're going to take a double portion of love, but I, I'll, I'll take nothing of his wrath and, and nothing of, of his uh, uh, eternal nature, nothing of his sovereignty. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll take some other things. That's always a mistake. God has, in his word, the Bible, revealed to all of us who he is. And you and I, in our sanctification, if we are, in fact, born again, we have received the Spirit. The, the Word of God tells us in, in Romans 8 that if we have not the Spirit, then we, then we are not His, which means that as a believer, you must, in fact, have the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, He is leading you to a greater, deeper, more glorious love for Christ, for God the Father, God the Spirit. But these guys can't physically see, and yet they, they understand, There's th th they hear that Jesus is coming. One of the biggest problems today is, is to talk to someone in, in our day, our age, and try to convince them that they have a need. <laughs> we, we've, we've told them all, sometimes through such sad preaching, that that preaching is likely a great sin. Preaching that says, look, God's not really angry at anybody. He doesn't really care what you're doing. He just wants to make your life better. That's a myth. It doesn't exist. The God of the Bible is angry at sin continuously. That same God in his love offers up his son as a means of reconciliation to all that have sinned. And yet if we continue to tell people this sorry gospel that's no, that's no gospel at all according to Paul, they never know that they must run as quickly as possible to Christ. Run for fear of life. Run for fear of ever everlasting condemnation. Run for fear of being beneath God's wrath. The only means of deliverance being Christ himself. His own testimony is that there's no way to the Father except through him. And there are many people today who have, because of the, the way that the gospel is proclaimed in its weak way, never, never think to run. We ought to get them to run. Desperately. The problem is they're blind. And that blindness is not a physical blindness, but a spiritual one. In fact, I'm going to ask you now to, to go and look with me in, in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. And, and the reason I'm having you do that is that I, I, I want to give kind of a diagnostic, if you will. Because when we talk to people, we, many of you have witnessed to your friends. I can recall numerous times I've witnessed to people, I've, I've told them about Christ, and in fact, there were times where I thought, well, it's getting ready to happen, God's getting ready to birth them from above, they're, they're getting ready to see, and they didn't. Why? You, 
we've just related everlasting eternal truths that there can be no more condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. And if you're not in Jesus, that means there is condemnation. Run quickly. And as you're sitting there alerting them, I, I, I can pull up a picture in my mind of a man that I, I, I'd witnessed to for probably next to two decades while we worked together. And yet he never so far has come to Christ. He knows that today I still pray for him. Today I still yearn to see him to know Christ. He knows that if he calls me, we're going to talk about faith in Christ. And yet he didn't. And I did all that I could, all, all I could mentally, physically, and spiritually, I, that I, I was able. I, I took him to the very edge, if you will. And he looked over and said, eh, it's not for me. My soul just almost fell to the floor. When he said that, I thought, I, we were there. I thought, I thought we're, we're right there. He, he can finally see, but no, he was blind. And his condition is actually chronicled for us right here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. The natural person, that means everybody born into the world who has not been redeemed, not given the Spirit. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. What does that mean? It means when he looks at the gospel, he sees no need. He looks at the gospel and, and thinks it to be nonsense. He, he thinks it's silly. Well, what do I need a Savior for? Why is God so angry? What makes you think I'm estranged? Well, because you've rejected Christ. All who reject Christ are estranged from God. There is no way to the Father that doesn't come directly through the Son. There are no side avenues. There are no other sweet deals where you can arrange something for yourself. You have neither the authority or ability, or from a biblical position, even the desire. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. I've explained to people that their need for Christ before walked them right up to the very edge. They turn and look at me and go, Eh, it doesn't make sense. doesn't work. I don't see the problem. I, I believe there's a God. Well, the demons do the same. In fact, they tremble, and yet they are unredeemed. You've done, you, if you think you've done well to believe there is a God, the Bible understands you've still done nothing. Confessing a God is, is something that all men ought to do. It only makes sense because if there is no God, there's no you, there's no, there's no universe. The idea that the universe came out of its own self and, and created itself is nonsense and madness and is the, the weakest form of thinking. Why, why can't people see it? Why, why can't they see Christ? Why, why can't they see their, their need? Why are they so disabled? Why are they so spiritually dead? because they're born in sin and formed in iniquity. You need to only go to Psalm 51. So we're reading here from Paul again. For the things of the Spirit of God are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Th this is where the phrase I find most annoying that so many want to use today. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual. What do you mean by that? Uh, nothing. I'm trying to con you. That's what that is. It's a con job. I'm spiritual, which means, look, I'm going to find my own way. Well, there, your own way is really the rather common way. It's called the broad way that leads to destruction. It's the, when I say broad way, it's not, a, it's not a big street downtown. It's the, the wide open road that all those who are spiritually dead and say things like, well, I'm spiritual. I'm just not a Christian. It's impossible to be spiritual without being a Christian. Doesn't matter what you are. You can, there are people who call themselves spiritists today. Uh, what a mess that is. There are people who say, I'm spiritual, I'm not biblical. Which is to say, I, I breathe, but I don't use air. Nonsense. Uh, I'm spiritual, but, but I, I don't 
I don't feel like I have to fall in line with Jesus. I'm spiritual. I don't believe in God. You understand all the nonsense I just said, right? And I, I find no other word for it other than maybe absurdity. But it's nonsense. And they say it because they can't understand anything else. They're incapable by virtue of their deadness towards God. They are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And then he takes a, a little bit of a turn here. The spiritual person. Now, this is the, the believer. This is the follower in Christ. This is the one who, who has been redeemed, who has the indwelling of the Spirit, who has been birthed from above. The spiritual person judges all things. Now, when he says judges all things, it means not by the powers of judgment that you possess, but he judges things through the, the word of God and through the counsel of God. We understand to ourselves to be inept, that, that my judgment simply decides nothing. Right? You, you can decide whether you like chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream better one than the other. Above that, really, we don't get to choose. The judge that judges us all is the determiner of those things. Not you, not me. That, that's why I, I find it most alarming when people say, well, you keep saying, I'm like, no, 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 you got to understand, I hold all our opinions to be, I esteem them all equally. I don't care for any of them. I find them all altogether worthless. Your opinion, my opinion about w what God does, in other words, your opinion apart from the Word. Our opinion apart from the Word is every bit as worthless as the world's opinion. Our opinion needs to be an informed one. As a believer, when it says a spiritual person believes, or, or a spiritual person judges all things, it means he's, he's seeing it through the counsel of, and the lenses of God's word. He's been given not only a, a spirit of rightness with God, but through the spirit indwelling of God and the word of God, he is beginning to see things in a way he could never see before. He's made alive to God. And that being made alive to God makes you distinct from those in the world. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Now, the world judges us all the time, don't they? Oh, you Christians. Oh, you this. Oh, you that. Now, they're trying to, but let's be honest about it again. They have neither the authority nor right to judge anything. They're the creature. The creator will, in fact, judge all men. It's appointed once for man to die and then the, then the judgment. That judgment is not a judgment for you by others or for them by you. It's judgment of the one who leaves this world by Christ, who is the head of all. He's the one that they must turn to, and if they don't, they will, in fact, according to Philippians 2, confess him to be the Christ, but only on their way to everlasting condemnation. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. You know why? Because if Christ judges you and judges you perfectly and rightly, and he judges you in his grace, he sees you as one of his own, purchased by his blood, then the authority of Christ supersedes any and all human authority. We don't have to fall beneath the judgment of men because we're, we're judged by God to be in his grace, which puts us beyond the judgment of men. But look at verse 16 there in, in Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? No one. That's a facetious question. That's a rhetorical question. Paul's not waiting for somebody to stick their hand up and go, oh, 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 I know. No, he's not. He, he never even looked up when he said this. But we have the mind of Christ. When it says that, what it means is you have the indwelling spirit of Christ, looking at the word of Christ, having given you the ability of the in, by means of the indwelling Christ, the spirit of Christ that's given you by means of your birth, New birth, that is. You're able to see the word in cl with clarity that you didn't have before. Have you ever wondered why I press so hard to have you be readers of the scriptures? Why I put out something weekly? Yeah. 
right here. You want to have the mind of Christ? You must just read the word of Christ, which is here, this Bible. And when you read the word of Christ, the spirit of Christ indwelling, every time you read, it's opening up things to you. It, it's letting you see what the, what the dead in Christ, the dead outside of Christ can't see. Let's, let, let's go back now to Matthew 20. We've talked about the spiritual condition of those born into the world. According to the book of Revelation, there's a, there's a second death reserved for those who were never born again. In other words, if you're born once, you die twice. And, and that, that's, a, that's a funny phrase that, that preachers have made up. But the idea is this. If you're only born naturally and not born again supernaturally, there is reserved for you a death that is an, an everlasting death. There will be the physical death that we all pass through, which is our, our means of entrance into eternity. But for the Redeemer, for the redeemed of, of Christ, we, we go through that death and enter into the joy of our Lord. For the unredeemed, they die and enter into death continually, from which there is no excise, no, no removal, only the act of constant dying, suffering, weeping, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, separation from all that's good. <coughs> Looking now at Matthew 20, look at verse 29. They left Jericho and a great crowd is following him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting, along, sitting by the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was passing, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. That, I want to spend a little time there. Because that's exactly what the, the phrase that ought to be burning in your mind and in my mind and upon every mind of, of every believer. We are to be telling the world to cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, son of David. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord, deal with me according to your goodness, not according to my sin. Lord, birth me from above. Lord, help me to run quickly. Help me to turn to Christ and to be saved. Because I've heard, I've heard about this second death. And I've heard about this, this life everlasting and that those are the choices men have been offered and that the only means to life everlasting is him who is life itself, Jesus Christ. So you and I ought to be talking to people constantly, knowing that in, in the end that you have neither the power nor they to birth them from above, to, to give them life everlasting. But there is one who works through the frailty, and that's the right way to understand it, the frailty of the preaching of the word. He works through the weak thing, bring about his strength. It's, it's the design by which God has decided to work. Through the preaching of the cross. The cross, which is nonsense to the world, is the means of their redemption. If only they will turn. And yet they have not the power because they're blind. And until Christ gives them eyes to see and ears to hear, they'll never. You and I need to understand that their lack of sight doesn't mean we don't proclaim the gospel. Their inability to hear doesn't mean we don't whisper in their ear, Christ is the only Savior. Jesus is the only means of redemption that God has appointed. And if you will not have him, you cannot have his eternal blessedness. There are people that think they get heaven by virtue of simply passing through this world. Simply not true. These blind men are more aware than the average person today who can see perfectly. They, ha they are more aware than, than, than people who think they have it got, got it really going on. These men who, who can't see, who, who've lost their sight or, or were born without it, they, they realize that they need something. They've heard about this Christ. Well, how'd they hear about it? People talking about it. When's the last time you and I spoke to our lost friends about their need for Jesus? You know, I, I get the same stuff you do. Do we have to talk about that? No, we don't have to, but thank God we get to. Thank God that God has offered me the opportunity one more time, maybe. Just maybe this one more time, and he'll break open that stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. I'm praying desperately. I think that's one of the keys you need to let them know is it, the world has told us things, and you and I believe it. The problem is they speak the, the, the lies of the, of, of the serpent. They speak the lies of their father. 
when, when we hear people say, well, they don't want to be invited to church. Do you know that's a huge lie? People find that when you invite them to church, you must think something of them. You must actually care about them. When you tell them about Christ, now there's a, there's a way to tell it that's wrong. And that way is, is, is that way which is really a means of, look, I, I, I am intellectually your superior, and I'm trying to tell you since you're so inferior about this thing that you can't see. That's pride and ignorance. They pretend to be witnessing. Witnessing is, look, I was dead too, but now I'm alive. I want to see you receive that life everlasting. I want to see you awakened to God. I want to see you in eternity. You know, there are people that I've, I've told them before, look, man, I, I don't want however long we're, we're here to be the end of the time I see and know you. I would love to see you in eternity. And yet for as long as you reject Christ, you reject an eternity of blessedness and you call down upon yourself the wrath of God. See, they're blind, but it's in a different way. It's in so much worse than physically being blind. Physical blindness means you can't see the beauty of God's hand, the things that he's done. And yet it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing compared to that blindness that says, well, I see everything. But I believe in no God and no Savior. That's a form of blindness that is terminal. It's worse than all the cancers collectively. It's worse than all the, the, the things that kill us collectively because the worst thing to die of is sin. And if you won't have Christ, you will die of your sin. To die of sin is to, be, to die in sin. And to die in sin, in fact, I, I've told you before, and it's easy to remember, there are only two ways really to die. One is in, in faith, which means you're trusting in Christ for all that you have and are. The other is in your sin. That's all there is. I don't care how you're taken. You're either taken in faith or in sin. And you and I need to be more plain about our speech. We speak to people, we've got to talk to them plainly. They, we owe them that. If we love them at all, if we care about them at all, if we have a heart that beats within our breast at all, then we need to tell them plainly. Look, man, I, I, I'm telling you with all that I am, if I've ever meant anything to you, if you've ever heard anything I'm saying, hear this. You must run today, not tomorrow, not someday, as quickly as you can towards Christ because you're not guaranteed another day. And I know that, that, that phrase has been cheapened by the, the misuse of it by so many who try to goad people into believing you can't make somebody believe. In fact, uh, under the understanding that I have, we need the Spirit of God to enable someone to see. But God has ordained the means, and the means is the witness of the church and the world to the dead outside of Christ, that they might in you see the love of Christ, and in you hear the gospel of Christ, and in, in from you hear about the cross of Christ, wherein God atones for sin, where he presses upon his son the wickedness of those that would be redeemed and then takes from his son and wraps them in his robe of righteousness. And that God has awakened us to that. Now, he hasn't awakened us because, it, it, you know, it's funny, pe people get really upset when you talk about being chosen. The problem is they believe that by chosen you mean choice. Paul denies that altogether. He said, look, there's not many noble, not many wise, not many powerful. But the crude things of this world, the, the simple things of this world, the simple ones, the small ones, you and me, God has redeemed. See, it's, 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 it's not just this overwhelming work of Christ. It has to be that. It's, it's a spirit-induced thing. It's being birthed from above. Again, John chapter 3, uh, I give it to you to, for your study today. Go and see what, what, John, what John tells us Jesus says to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, teacher, guy who'd been in the, in the temple his whole life, a Pharisee. You can't even see the kingdom of heaven. The natural man can't. 
He can be religious. He can be. He, he can have several several letters following behind his name. Because you're not saved by wisdom. You're not. You're not saved by being more gentle. You're not saved by being a little nicer. You're saved. You're saved by grace, which is God's unmerited favor. And in that grace, He brings light. He allows you to see where you could not, hear what you could not. That, that's why, you know, you know what's funny about preaching? Preaching is a strange thing. It can, in fact, only ever happen inside the church of Christ. There are many people who talk about preaching. Most of them can't do it. Many people talk about preaching, and they, and they don't know what it is. And they say, well, look, can we have less of that? Can we have more songs and and, and more more things. No, actually, we're, we're going to stick with the preaching of the Word. It's, a, it's the prescribed means by which God has determined not only to redeem a people for Himself, but to edify and to build up the, the, the precious faith of His saints. These guys cry out, Lord, have mercy on us. Son of David. This is Jesus. Your mission your cause for your existence resides right there. The reason God has redeemed you is for his glory and for your good. But that glory and that good is manifested in the witness that you and I set forth in the world. As, as we walk amongst the blind, seeing. As we walk amongst the deaf, hearing. They can neither see, see nor hear Christ. You can read the word of God to them. By the way, I think that's actually quite wonderful when we do that. I, I, I know the strange things they'll do when you read the word to them or you, or you say things to them. You know, I, I was in a habit when my kids were little. The habit was we would we would turn the, the TV off because I didn't think much of it anyway. And I would read a book to them, a chapter at a time. And then we would read a chapter of the scripture. This was before they could half the, half the time speak. Half the time before they understood most of the words, but I was reading. I was laboring to read, and I would read because I understood, Lord, I'm, I'm bringing to bear your word against their soul that they might, in fact, trust in Christ and be redeemed. I read to them before they were saved in hopes of the fact that they might get saved. And I, if they were home with me as much as I wish they were now, I, I would read to them again because we need that word. Read to your friends if they'll let you. Read to them from the Word of God. Because you do not know, you cannot know, what it is that God will use to break open the soul that is rigid and hard against God's grace and mercy. These men cried out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Look at the next verse. And stopping. Jesus is moving along. He's a very busy guy. He's moving along and all his disciples with him. And they're, they're, he's, he's one of these, these teachers that moves about. It's a peripatetic teacher. He's moving around and he's teaching as he, and these guys are following. And, and, and he stops. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? I love his directness here. I, I, I appreciate that so greatly. He doesn't mess, mess about the way some do today. W one of my greatest distresses about the ministry today is men who are overly gentle and by gentle I don't mean gentle in the, in the proper way but I mean they're effeminate we don't need effeminate men in the pulpit we need men to fill the pulpit men with chest men with brains and men with hearts they fill the pulpit and they're scared to death of God so they'll give you the full measure of God's word what do you want me to do for you. This should be your friend. They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be open. When you pray, do you pray for your friend's eyes to be open? Your children's eyes to be open? That's how I prayed for mine when they were little, my, my children, my friends now that are still outside of Christ. Lord, open their eyes. I've set Christ before them hundreds of times. And I know that unless you exercise your sovereign will and open their eyes, they'll continue to be blind to it, despite the fact that I lay it before them constantly. 
Lord, open their eyes. Plead for them desperately. They don't know to plead for themselves. We should plead for them then. Lord, let our eyes be open. You know, this is, this is a bit of a parable of the Christian life and how it started. Look at what it says. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes. You know, today, if you tell somebody you pity them, they're likely to punch you in the mouth. Jesus here is pitying them. He sees their estate, and he understands it. And if you see us, if you see us apart from Christ, you understand the need of pity there. You should have pity upon those people that are outside of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you make them any less at all, because to do so is, is, is ultimately not to understand them. But to see them and understand where they are estranged from Christ, can't see him because they have neither eyes nor ears. They have physical eyes and ears, and yet they're clothed in sin and wickedness. Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight. What's the first thing they do when they can see? Last three words. And followed him. If anyone has sight, if they have spiritual life in them, they will follow Christ. There's no exception to that rule. It's an absolute. They are blind and dead in sin and trespass, and until they are made alive in Christ, and until they follow after Christ, they are understood by virtue of their own witness against them to be dead in sins and trespasses, lacking spiritual life. They're moving about, but they're doing so apart from any spiritual strength, any spiritual ability. So they may in fact be spiritual, but it's a dead spirit that inhabits them. It's a spirit of lifelessness. I've heard preachers say it's, it's like being stillborn. No, actually, it's not that good. Stillborn is, that child was alive in the womb at one time. The dead, the dead that are outside of Christ have never known life. And if you and I don't pity them, don't shed tears for them, don't sweat praying desperately for them, then we don't understand their estate. They need God to supernaturally intervene. They need for God to step in. I, I, I'm going to beg those, those believers that are here, no longer pray in a way, oh, Lord, please, and then ask silly things. Lord, do whatever, whatever you must, Lord. Bring them to the knowledge of Christ, whatever the cost, it, it, it is to be paid. Rather, they, they would find Christ and lose their life than live a long life separated from God now and everlastingly. We need to pray adult prayers. Lord, they're blind. Lord, they're deaf. They look at your creation and all they see are things that they think popped out of nowhere. They believe in, in, in magic. They, they believe, and they call it science, but it's, it's, it's really children's magic. And it's madness and it's insanity. Having been brought into Christ, I believe that you and I should pity people outside of Christ. Now, don't tell them that to how you look at them. They'll be upset by that and they won't only hear your witness. But you and I came from that same place, estranged from God, separated by sin, Wrath of God headed to my direction, waiting to swallow me up when God in his grace awakened me, took away the scales from my eyes, unstopped my ears that I might hear the glory and the majesty of all creation that cries forth his glories. See, these men were physically blind, but there's a greater blindness. And that blindness is had by all who reject Christ. Christ is God's offer of salvation. If you reject Christ, you reject his offer. And you remain in darkness. But what is reserved is an even greater darkness. An eternal, everlasting darkness.
as you get ready to leave today, what, I, I want one thing on your mind. I want you to I want you to remember what Christ said. What is it you would have me do for you? What is it you want? R- really, what He's asking. What do you want from me? Lord, I, I want to no longer be blind to your grace. I, I want to hear creation as it cries forth your glory. I, I want to hear and see as one who's been made alive in you. See, you, I, I think you and I need to pray for our friends and our family members in a, in a more powerful way. It's not that the, the strength of the prayer exists in, in, in the fact that we, we proceed with, with the such with such desperation. And, and, you know, I think that's the only healthy Christian prayer is a desperate one. Lord, please, save them for your name's sake. There is power in our prayer, but that power is, is the fact that the, the God who hears is the God who loves and loves to redeem. So I'm going to ask you today as, as my last point, please, Pray for those that you know who can't see. Bow your head. Father, I ask God that you would make of us a powerful praying people. That as we look to the world, we see what they need is to cry out like these blind men. Son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, I pray, God, that you would awaken many. That you would use the witness of this church, of Walnut Grove, every single member, as they labor desperately in tears. As as they labor beneath the weight of knowing the outcome of that life spent without Christ. As they labor knowing what those who can't see can, in fact, not know. I pray, God, that you would give us a certain joy in that same prayer to know that the God that reigns is the God that hears, and the God that hears is also the God that raises from the pit. Gives life where there was none. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would hear us today and that our friends and family members would all come to saving faith in Christ to be redeemed and that their pitiable estate might be removed and the everlasting joy of Christ be set upon them. Lord, I pray for the witness of everyone here, that it would be a strong, vibrant witness. That kind of witness used by you to awaken the dead. Oh, Lord, I pray, God, you would use us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Pat, could you just miss his brother?